Hi, I'm Stephanie Pinnell, and I am the branch manager here at our North Regional location in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'll be presenting today with Terry Hill. He's our deputy director for Durham County. All right. Terry, you're still muted. I always do that. You think okay. you think after a year of COVID, I would know better. But uh, I'm, right. Terry, I'm Terry Hill. I'm the deputy director for Durham County Library. And to give you a little background information about Durham County, uh, we have seven locations. We have four regional libraries and three branch libraries. And we also have a community engagement department that consists of our bookmobile services as well as our tech mobile. And we are a part of Durham County government. We're often confused with the city of Durham. I don't know why there are two separate governments here, but that's, that's how we're set up. Uh, and our library director is Tammy Baggett. Stephanie, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to get us started. Oh, all right. So I have had the pleasure of leading a very diverse team of 21 librarians since November of 2020. We meet once a month and we follow a, a timeline that was created with the help of our racial equity officer with the goals of the library in mind. So just to give you a little bit of background information about how the library uh, was able to develop a racial equity team. First, Durham County is a member of North Carolina, of the North Carolina um, GARE team, which is the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. We work very closely with our racial equity officer, who is Quayley Rashid Henry, who is tasked with moving racial equity forward with, for Durham County. Um, our library director, Tammy Baggett, was one of the first members to serve on the Durham County GARE team. So I expressed to our racial equity officer that I was very interested in racial equity and just wanting to volunteer. I reached out, I emailed her, and not knowing that Durham County had a whole team that was already in place, and that um, our director was already on that team. So that's how I got involved. And once I expressed that to the racial equity officer, I let the director know that this was an interest of mine. Then I, um, she was very willing and just, um, she strongly encouraged me to put a, a library team together. She wanted to see that happen for Durham County. So that's how we came about with our own little library equity team. And here we are six months later. So that's a little bit of background about that. So some of the goals that we have set for ourselves for Durham County Library racial equity team are to complete racial equity training for all of our team members to gain an awareness of the history of race and our own implicit and explicit biases. We wanted to examine individual, institutional, and structural racism. We have worked to identify biases in our programming, policies, and, goal, and services, that's our goal, and to educate and train our entire library staff in racial equity. So, so these are some of the goals that we put forth that we want to work on for the coming years to come. <laughs> All right. So some of the things we've been able to achieve just in the past few months are the formation of our team. So I was able to get a team together. We had 21 people to come forward and say, I wanna be a part of this. Um, since then, we have provided definitions of racial equity and established a common language, meaning that everyone understands what certain terms are. Um, we've also put rules in place for our discussions. We have um, completed a foundational training, meaning that we've all attended the Racial Equity Institute training, um, REI. We did the groundwater training. That's a found, just to give everyone a foundation for this work. So the county did pay for that. 
We have also had um, a community engagement just among our team, meaning that we've had conversations about race, um, our racial experiences, and how these experiences have impacted our lives. We have completed several training videos and webinars as a group. And we are also starting to implement the GAR toolkit within the library. So that is a, it's an instrument that is provided by the North Carolina GAR um, that the Durham County GAR team has put together that we are working on. And I'm trying to take that same toolkit and implement it within the library. So those are some of the things that we've been able to achieve. Um, areas that we have identified as a group that we would like to work on in the library are um, work on advancing racial equity in the library are customer service, hiring and promotion, public engagement, contracting, budget, policy creation and implementation. And Terry and I will go through and break down each one of these areas for you to provide a little bit more detail. So for customer service, it is important for staff to know that the administration backs them when it comes to being treated fairly and not discriminated, discriminated against by other employees or the public. If you report a problem to your management, will they handle it? Or are, are there policies in place that empower staff to speak up for themselves or others? It's important to address customer service by hiring staff that represent the community so that customers find it easier to approach and ask for help. We think that eliminating microaggressions takes work, but it is necessary work that needs to be done. People need to be aware of what they are doing and to make, conscious, to make a conscious effort to stop it. So education is very key in this area. We also feel that it is important for you as staff members to know your policies and how your organization will support you. If you find yourself in a situation where someone is being racist to you or a coworker, would you step in to help? How would you handle this situation? How would you handle a coworker who doesn't wanna help a customer because of their own biases? So these are things to really think about and to take into consideration. Having support for management is important in handling all of these situations. Durham County has a customer service philosophy that is being developed that will launch later in the fall. Having a service, having a service philosophy in place is a commitment by the organization to everyone who is being served. So hiring and promotion is another area that we have identified that we would like to try to work on being more equitable within the library. Know from the very beginning that the pool of applicants that you will most likely have applying for library jobs is going to be white females. That's the demographic for this type of profession. So one way to one way to try and create a more diverse applicant pool is to find out if management can make a request to human resources that when open positions are posted, that they are posted at more library schools and statewide on the statewide website, not just only county job boards. Also, you need to be very, very careful and be aware of the laws that are in place. You don't want to break laws or violate anyone's rights. Yes, and to, to add to that about the, um, the federal laws, uh, we also have to remember that when it comes to hiring practices, that discrimination can go in both directions. So there are situations where someone 
may be, <clears throat> excuse me, selected for a position because they are a minority, or they may be selected for a position because, um, because they're not, or not selected for a position because they're, they're a minority. Uh, so we don't want either situation. And we know that our real challenges, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, that the lack of diversity in our applicant pools, that's where our real problem is. So what are some things we can do about that? Because um, we really have no control over who applies for our, our positions. So this really takes some work, in my opinion, um, outside of the recruitment process. And as professionals, I, I feel like we have a responsibility to do what we can to recruit more people to the profession. And that can be things that are as simple as participating in your local high school's career day, uh, establishing a internship program for high school students for the summer, uh, teen volunteers, that's another good way, but just to get people exposed to the profession and, and a wider, um, more variety of people who, who are exposed to the, to the profession. Um, I know that's why I'm sitting here today because someone um, who thought I might be interested in this profession approached me and asked if I had ever considered it. And of course, my first answer was no, because uh, I, was, I was in my second year of college and, and this librarian I was working for at the time at the university library, he's like, well, have you considered library school? And I said, no, who does that? And he's like, well, I did that because I'm a librarian. Um, but it takes those those one on one interactions and getting people interested and in, um, and sharing what you actually do that we don't just sit around and read all day like a lot of people think that that we do. Um, so the other thing, um, as far as is recruitment goes, is um, you know redefining what we consider to be a a well qualified applicant, and that doesn't mean that we want to hire people who aren't qualified for our positions. But maybe we need to shift what it is that we that we focus on, because a lot of times when we post positions and we're interviewing, we're really focused on, well, how many years experience does this person have? But that doesn't take into account, um, you know, some of those interpersonal skills that we really need in this profession, uh, because we know we can't teach those. You can teach someone how to uh, search a database. You know, you can do that a thousand times over, but you can't necessarily teach someone how to um, diffuse a, a situation with a with an angry customer or uh, or just getting along with your coworkers. Because uh, for those of you who are who are managers, you know that uh, when it comes to um, any type of personnel issue with with an employee, it's usually more about behavior than it is. Um, them not being able to search a database or their program is not quite as, as good as it, it should be. So um, really shifting that focus, I think, is a way that would help us um, broaden our applicant pool and, and maybe even consider people who are in the pool that we wouldn't otherwise um, take a second look at. We also want to advance equity and public engagement. There are barriers to public engagement that we have identified and that we will talk about um, an approach over uh, an approach to overcoming these barriers. So one example of a way to overcome barriers to public engagement is one through training staff. Durham County offers paid memberships to professional organizations um, that offer training and resources such as ALA and NCLA. Training staff is necessary because the following situations can occur. Staff can often make assumptions about customers based on their appearance, for example, clothing or hair. You can have staff members who don't enforce policy equitably. Staff can walk away or appear to be busy to avoid assisting customers. The second way to overcome the barrier of poorly trained staff is to require training. Those can include, but not limited to, racial equity, how to deal with difficult customers, and how to deal with customers who are experiencing homelessness. Most importantly, to overcome the barrier of poorly trained staff is to hold them accountable, follow through, make sure they are attending the trainings, 
have weekly or monthly check-ins and make it part of their work plan and appraisal. Another barrier that we have identified to um, public engagement is accessibility. So accessibility issues can include library locations not being near bus stops or just public transportation in general. There are a few libraries in Durham that are not near or on a bus route and customers are, they have to be dropped off at least two blocks away and have to sometimes walk down a road that is, um, that doesn't have a sidewalk. It can, we, also, we have one that's right on a, a busy highway that people have to walk down the highway to get to the library. So that's not safe. Um, there is another bus stop near another library that we have and that route stops pretty early during the day about six or seven o'clock. So if there is a program that someone wanted to attend in the evening, it would be hard for them to do so. Um, one example that I have to stress how important it is for transportation access to the public is we hosted, we had a library that hosted a program and the program was geared specifically towards older adults with chronic diseases. But this location had a bus stop that was directly in front of the building and the program was hosted during the morning. So because of these factors, it was an extremely successful program in the sense of the number of attendees that were able to get there. So we, we, we counted it a success. And then the people who came, they actually enjoyed it. So I just wanna make it clear that this is our experience and our assumption that these issues have a greater impact on underserved population in Durham County. Yeah, so when it comes to digital resources and communication channels, uh, we all know that a lot of the resources we have in our libraries are only available online. And you know, there are, of course, many that are available in, in both print and electronic format. But something to consider when looking at your uh, collection policy is to think about if your level of investment in electronic resources, if that matches the level of access uh, that, your, that your residents have uh, to electronic resources in your community. Because uh, here in Durham, for example, um, African-Americans in Durham are twice as likely to be without uh, internet and computer access as white residents in Durham. So there's, there is a big gap there. Um, and, and most often, um, our, our collection of practices don't necessarily line up with, with uh, the access or lack of access in our, in our community. And that is why the, the work that libraries are doing to, to try to shrink the digital divide is, is so important when we do offer you know, computer access or check out hotspots and, and those kinds of things. As far as communication goes, uh, this is another uh, area where we, we find a, uh, that we have a lot of challenges. Um, because we often uh, promote our services and programs through channels that, that assume that people have access to those. So through social media, our website, uh, email blasts, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, our marketing department, they do a fantastic job uh, promoting uh, all the great things that, that we do. But we also know that we do have problems reaching pro uh, part of our, of our community. But I want to share an example with you of, of a librarian that, that works at our Stanford L. Warren branch. And that branch uh, serves a predominantly African-American community. And one reason he's been really successful in promoting his programs is because he really understands how information travels in his community. Because again, not everyone is connected and, and two, not everyone wants to receive their information uh, electronically. But he does have a very, um, a uh, strong sense of how things are, how information travels in that community. And a lot of times he promotes his programs through word of mouth. Uh, he will hand people flyers to his programs when they come into the library or even pick up the phone and call people to invite them uh, to come out to his, to his programs. And, you know, he always has very high attendance at his, at his programs. And that's even without going through what are now our more traditional methods of, of promoting programs. 
Um, with that said, I also um, we also have to acknowledge the the larger uh, gap that that COVID has um, has caused when it comes to to access. Uh, of course, when our library buildings were closed, we were not able to provide um, computer access, Wi-Fi access, those things, and you know we all we all dealt with with those issues. Uh, of course, all the hotspots that we had were already checked out, so we couldn't get those back to to get back into the to the community. Uh, but even once we set up our takeout service, um, we realized that um, you know even then we were we were creating another barrier for people to have access. Um, you know, we we were doing all we could, but to take advantage of that service, you did have to have phone access or computer access. And even if you had a phone, you, you could call in to reserve an item or to make your appointment, but still it goes back to, well, how, how would you find out that this service is even happening or what number to call to, um, to take advantage of it? All right, so another place in um, the library that we have identified that we wanted to try to be more equitable is through our programs. And, here we have two examples of programs that Durham County had, Durham County Library has collaborated with our community partner, Durham Public Schools, to try and create more equitable access for students. So on the left, you see Bull City Slam Card. And so a Slam Card is schools and libraries achieving more. And what that is, it's a library card that provides access to Durham Public School students using their ID numbers. So students are automatically enrolled in this program with their student ID. And um, they do have to come in to activate their card. And, but they can have this card in addition to a regular library card, which is a benefit because if they have a card and say a parent, you know, checked out some items on it and those items, um, were lost or overdue, then that could possibly prohibit them. So having this, this individual card helps, it helps them. Also, um, we also have another program that we are working with Durham Public Schools this summer is the Summer Meals Program. And so we do this during the weekdays. Um, Durham Public Schools provides the meals and we have, the libraries have provided a space for people to be able to come and pick those meals up. So one of the, some of the things that we want you to really think about when you are programming is just think about who are you targeting to attend the programs and how do you market those programs? What types of programs are we offering to the public? Is this, a, is this program serving or meeting a community need? Um, think about who the presenters are and you know, sometimes you pay presenters to come and do programs. Are you targeting or using the same types of presenters all the time? Or is it a very diverse mixed group of presenters that you're given the opportunity to um, do programs for your system? Uh, we also want you to think about uh, where the programs are being presented. Are you only offering the best or the most premium programs you know, at certain locations? Are you diversifying the locations so that everyone gets to experience this great opportunity to, you know, or whatever program that you have for them? And also think about the time of day. So I mentioned that earlier in, a, in, the, ex, in the example about accessibility. I have had the personal experience of setting up programs for seniors at night or in the evening during the fall and finding out that that's not gonna work because nobody showed up. So that was a learning experience as a fairly new librarian, but it is something to really think about. Um, you know, who are you targeting and, and what works for that particular group? So of course, when you're programming for seniors, you wanna try to do things during the day. Um, in the morning, because that's when they're most likely to be able to come out and participate. Yeah, and the, the time of day, um, the, another issue that, that uh, goes along with that is uh, childcare can become an issue. 
Um, that is something we, we've seen with um, scheduling like computer classes during the evening and things like that. Um, so, you know, maybe a creative way to, to work around that issue is to look at doing some simultaneous programming. So maybe there's programming for the parents, you know, for the adults and also programming for the children at the same time. Uh, one very successful program we, we had that was, um, that, that went, that took this format was, um, while our main library was closed, we opened up a maker lab in the Northgate Mall in Durham. And uh, one of our staff members started this program called Talk, Walk, and Eat. And it was literally those three things, you talked and walked and, and ate as well. Uh, but the adults, uh, but this program was designed for people to uh, work on their English or Spanish language skills. So an English and Spanish speaker were paired up and they could either sit and talk or they could walk the mall to get their, their exercise. And then, um, during the during this time their their children were in the maker lab in programs um, that were that were geared more for them and then at the end everyone came together to to eat a meal um, and that was a program that was funded by our by our friends at the library so we were able to to pay for uh, for dinner for everyone and that ran for six weeks on wednesday evenings and was very successful but you know that's that's just one creative way to um to be able to overcome that barrier that a lot of uh, people have when it comes to uh, attending programs during the evening. All right, so just a quick recap of how we think that you can overcome barriers to public engagement are by realizing and recognizing biases, developing communication channels for staff and residents, promoting meaningful community pr participation, increasing visibility of equity and social justice, promoting fairness and opportunity in practices, collaborating again across agencies and building community partnerships and trust. Um, I know that a lot of the librarians here in Durham County, we work very closely with other Durham County agencies or departments within our, just within the county and we work very hard to do outreach and build community partners. So that's really how we're able to get the work done that we do. Um, I think that we do a great job at it. And that would be my recommendation is um, also as far as racial equity work, if that's something that you are interested in implementing in your library system. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little about um, the financial side with contracts and, and budgets. So if, if you have any library branches or services that are targeted toward traditionally underrepresented, um, underserved communities, you do have to be mindful of the perception uh, when it comes to how funds and resources are allocated. Uh, so, uh, for example, here in Durham County, as I mentioned earlier, we have seven locations and um, our three branches, Maine, Stanford, Warren, and Bragtown, um, of course, are, are very different in, in size, but Stanford, Warren, and Bragtown are, are small branches, uh, and they are both uh, located in predominantly African-American communities. Now, when we look at allocating like our uh, supply budgets or our program budgets, um, those locations, of course, will receive uh, fewer dollars just because um, they have fewer staff there. There are fewer programs that happen there. But if, if just looking from the outside in, if you looked at the amount of programming funds that may be um, assigned to our Southwest Regional, for example, that has a lot of programming, uh, it could appear that there's some, some disparity there and maybe even based on race. But just be aware that there can be those kinds of perceptions um, when people don't don't know or see the whole the whole picture with those things. And as far as contracts go, um, that can also be a challenge when we do focus on contracting with minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, one of the challenges that we we find with working with with small businesses um, in general is that um, our county does require a one million dollar insurance policy that the contractor must have, and sometimes that can be an obstacle for for small businesses. Uh, but the other issue is also um, 
if the business is uh, is really small, they may not be able to perform the scope of work that we need. So when we, for example, have the um, interiors of our libraries painted, uh, that is something that you know we have a very tight time frame. We have to get it done so we're not close to the public too long. We try to do that maybe over a holiday weekend that we're going to be closed or something. Um, you know, where if we contracted with a much smaller company, it might take them a week to get that that finished, and we're just not able to to accommodate that kind of of time frame. But I think this um, really highlights the importance of supporting um, minority and women on on businesses, uh, because uh, you know as they are able to get more business, they you know of course will be able to to grow their business, and as a a previous small business owner my, myself. I know that, um, you know, of course, small businesses appreciate you purchasing their services and goods, but there are a lot of other ways that as individuals, we can help those businesses out, whether it's promoting them through our social media challenges or our personal network. Um, even seeing, you know, talking with the business owner to see like what kind of help you can offer. Could you set up a social media account for them? Could you help update their web page? Um, you know, things like that, or even bookkeeping skills. Because if they're able to save on spending on those kinds of services, that's money they can then reinvest in helping to grow their, their business. Uh, fortunately, Durham County has, um, we, we have a website on our, um, that's linked off of our county uh, site that's for uh, minority and women uh, business enterprise. And this is to assist minority and women owned businesses who have an interest in uh, providing goods and services to the county. So that's a good resource for people to go to um, if they are a small business and uh, to find out what, what is needed to actually do business with an organization the size of, of the county government. Okay, so next, um, the real fun stuff with policies and, and implementation. Um, of course, you know, one thing when looking at our policies through, through a racial equity lens, you know, things um, as far as, you know, customers having a permanent address uh, being required to get a library card. We know that not everyone has a permanent address. So there, there has to be things in place uh, or types of cards in place where people can still get access to our, to our resources uh, without having uh, to prove a permanent address. Uh, fines and fees, of course, Durham County Library is now fine free. Um, we have been since uh, July 1st of 2020. And um, that, of course, has been well received by the community um, and, and has really uh, taken down a lot of barriers that people had to resources, uh, getting rid of those fines off of their, off of their accounts. Um, but as Stephanie mentioned earlier, the SLAM card, um, that was uh, conceived out of uh, the out of need for students to be able to still access resources when um, at times they may have too many fines on their, on their account. And of course this uh, predates the uh, us going fine free, but we did notice that we had a lot of, of, of kids whose parents were using their card and they would have fines. And then, you know, the, the kids really didn't put it at a disadvantage because they can't um, access library resources. So when we, we partnered with Durham Public Schools uh, for this SLAM card, that was a way for us to, to make sure the kids still have that. They only are able to check out five items, um, but you know, th there were never any fines on these accounts and, um, and they can't have this in addition to their regular library card. Um, looking at policies in particular and thinking about how, uh, you know, what, what thoughts going into um, the development of those policies and are, are you targeting specific groups in doing so? Um, so in reviewing our courteous conduct policy, which we, we've tried to do a lot of work on that policy over the past couple of years, because it was really becoming a, a long list of all the things that you can't do um, and not, not necessarily being a very uh, welcoming um, document to represent our, our organization. But uh, one thing that we, that really struck us was looking at bag restrictions. And, you know, when we looked at that and we were really honest with ourselves, that was put in place because of, uh, you know, customers who come in that we may assume are experiencing homelessness or, or customers who come from across the street at, from the shelter. 
And that was to try to keep them from bringing all their bags in. But we also noticed that if, uh, for example, a family came in and they had three or four diaper bags and a backpack, you know, nothing was ever said to them. So that was one area that we, we were not being fair and equitable in how we implemented and, and carried out that, that policy. Another one is uh, looking at the age limit. Uh, so this is also a big uh, discussion uh, among our, our library staff each year when we review our policies is, yeah. you know, what age can students be in the library without uh, parental supervision? And when we look at uh, increasing that age, oftentimes it will, um, it, it will cut out a lot of our middle school kids who come to the library after school. And, you know, two of our libraries are directly across the street from middle schools. So after school, that's where the kids come. And for, for many of them, that's their only option for after school. And their parents come, you know, to pick them up after, after they get off work. But, um, you know, the, we've, had to, we've had to leave that age low enough so we can accommodate those, those kids when they, when they come in because, um, you know, raising the limit would then kick all of them out essentially. And, and that's, and that really, it, it, it is an issue of race too, because it's primarily African-American students who, who are there after school. Um, so that's something we've had to be very mindful of as well. Um, also being able to allow uh, staff to be a little flexible in enforcing policies, especially um, with, with the age, with younger kids, because there, there are some situations where we have, uh, for example, there might be an eight or nine year old child who is at the library taking care of their three or four year old brother. Um, now, neither of them should be there alone without parental supervision, but um, we also know that there are situations where that child may be safer staying there in the library um, with our staff than if we told them they had to leave, uh, especially if we're not able to contact a parent to come and, to, to come and get them. So um, those are just some of the examples of uh, policy changes we've made and we continue to look at our policies. We do an annual review, as I mentioned, um, but there's, there's always somewhere, you know, we can make some improvements on, on how we uh, write and carry out our policies. Okay, so if your library is interested in advancing racial equity, some of the things that they may wanna start with is possibly doing an equity analysis or a racial audit. And equity analysis will collect, organize and analyze data specific to equity issues and hopefully reveal gaps and in the efforts towards equity. Working with the toolkit or template will allow you to be able to map out a plan, look at achievements and gaps and communicate those needs to your administration. And most importantly, um, leadership development, which is just that. People who are willing to step up and do the work needed to advance equity in your libraries. Professional learning and development is a way for employees to be aware and be informed. So um, I would, if you're definitely interested, and this is something that you would like to start in your library, first I would start on the county level and see if your county is already a part of the North Carolina GARE, the Government Alliance for Racial Equity because that's what Durham County is. And also the city of Durham, like Terry was telling you. And so I've attended a few um, events with the North Carolina gear and most of the counties are, but check there first, start with your county, see if they are already a member and then see what your county is currently doing for its organization as a county government. Um, if there is a racial equity team in place for that. And that's where I would start. That would be my recommendation is to get started there on the county level. And then, like I said, once you have established that, I would reach out to community partners and just see what is available in your area and who you can partner with to be able to do the work that you desire to do. Yeah, and also know that um, 
we're all making our way through this. And, and this is not something that is going to change overnight or there's some magic formula or, or, or pill that you can take and, and everything is, is okay. But it is something that, that we have to bring some awareness to both in our uh, personal and professional lives. You know, like a lot of things, this is something that starts at home. It's not something that we just come to work to work on. It, it has to start uh, within our personal lives as well. So, so in closing, if I can offer two pieces of advice um, with this is um, the best thing any of us can do is just be willing to be uncomfortable and have uncomfortable conversations, ask uncomfortable questions, um, receive uncomfortable feedback, because um, that, you know, in that being uncomfortable, that's where we're all going to grow. And, and the next thing is that we all have to be willing to speak up, but we also have to be willing to extend each other some grace, because, um, you know, as I said, we're all making our way through this. And, you know, instead of, you um, Everything that happens, you know, is not done maliciously necessarily. Um, it a lot of times just people just don't know, and that and that is for all of us. So it's really important to look at those as learning and teaching opportunities, um, you know, so we can all grow together. And that's what I was going to just tag on to what Terry is saying is just know that this is a learning. You are going to be constantly learning and addressing racial equity issues, addressing it and calling it out to light is fairly new for all of us. So this is a learning process. You're going to continuously learn and you have to continuously, you know, and it's going to take work. So like Terry said, it's not going to happen overnight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. This is all new, you know, but I, it's something I really wanted to do. So I stepped up and said, this is something that I think um, the library would be, it would benefit from. So thank you for having us today. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Terry and Stephanie. Um, folks, if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the chat. Um, we have a couple of questions that came in on that Google form that was sent out a few weeks ago. And one of the questions that I wanted to kind of share with you both was, um, there was a question, we started a racial equity team early last year and we've received a lot of pushback from the county government. How do we work with organizations um, to request the services and funding from the county government um, and kind of keep the racial equity team going. Uh, okay, so that's a two-part question. I don't really, like, as of right now, we don't have a budget. Um, we meet through Teams. That's the platform that we use here in Durham County. So we have our monthly meetings, but we don't have a budget. Like I said, we've just started and we have identified the areas that I presented today um, as areas that we want to work on, but we also have the support of our administration and our county government because they actually created and hired a racial equity officer. So it depends on, like I said, I would go and see if your county is a part or the North Carolina um, GARE organization and then you might be able to gain support from them to help support your efforts within the library so I think I would start there I don't know if I really answered that question no I think that's a really good point and I think that you know if if folks are doing things internally but they'd like a little bit more support from outside organizations GARE is a really good place to start um, and there are a lot of really free um, training, not training, but like webinars. So I really had to seek things out, but because I have the racial equity officer, I can go to her and ask her, what should we be looking for? Um, Durham County paid for the racial equity training that we took through REI, which is located in Greensboro. So I know that that's a very expensive training. I don't think the library could afford to pay for that. I know they couldn't, but because they offered it to all of government employees, they opened it up like that. 
we just jumped on it. And I was like, I sent the email, making sure that everybody that was in our group, please go and sign up for this free training. Um, but if you really want to do the work, like I actually took it upon myself to pay for a, a workshop that came out um, pre-COVID, it was right before, right when COVID hit, and it was in Greensboro, but I had to take my car and drive, you know, I did it all on my own personal time, but I paid for it because I really wanted it that badly, and it wasn't that expensive, but it was just something that came across um, while I was at work, and I saw it, and I just jumped on the opportunity and paid for the workshop, and I asked for time off, and I went and did it, and it was, you know, that was a good foundation for me to get started. Yeah, definitely. As someone who's attended REI training, I, I think the, the time that you put into it just in your personal life is helpful. Um, we have a question, a clarifying question from Kim asking, what was the topic of the program you did for adults with chronic illnesses? The topic, oh, so that was another partnership that we did with our health department. And so they offer a program, it's a series on um, how to manage chronic diseases and it's geared towards older adults. And so what they want, they want one group to try and come to the whole entire series. And we had actually offered that program through the library twice. So, I was the first one to do it and I offered it in the evening during the fall at like six o'clock in the evening thinking, oh, these singers are gonna come back and attend this program. And it was a complete flop. And they offered, and like I said, I was at a, at a location that was not on a bus line or anything like that. Um, but then there was this same exact program was offered again. We agreed to do it at a different location and they did it in the morning. The location is right there on the bus line and it was an overwhelming, overwhelming response. And those seniors came in and they participated through the entire series. So it was very successful, but yes, it was a program that we uh, collaborated with our Durham health department or um, on how to deal or how to manage with um, chronic diseases. We have another question that was um, sent to me privately um, asking, will you eventually roll in like LGBTQ issues um, into the equity framework that you have or the equity team? I think so. Um, as of right now, we were just trying to deal with racial equity. Durham County does a lot to support um, our different groups. And we also have someone on the call today who, who does that work for us. So we work really hard to make sure that we include every group. And I even had the thought last night that as far as programming, like if you want to, like I was thinking about Cumberland County, for example. And I was thinking, well, that's a, a group, that's a county that has a very high veteran military population. So how many people are in that community that who have limited ability? You know, they may have some type of disability or maybe um, missing limbs or something, amputees. So how many programs do the library offer that are geared specifically towards them? So that came to me last night. I've actually, I, that was a, a fairly new program that um, Durham County has offered, but yes, I would answer that as a yes. We do work very hard to make sure that all groups are included. Not gonna exclude anybody because I think the, the goal is to be able to create a library system that truly represents our entire community. Yeah, and I think the Cumberland County example is perfect because you're looking at what are the demographics of your patrons and your community base, you know, what you know is representative. Cumberland County may not always be representative of Durham County, but you're like those efforts can be made kind of on a county basis. We have a question from Adam uh, saying, nice work with the SLAM program. Are y'all approaching the 
problem of parents with cards that have lost access as well. I know that's a challenge and wonder how you strike a balance between considering material loss and users' loss of access. Tara, you want to answer that? Yeah, so um, just to clarify, are you asking about um, you know, what are we doing for, for the parents or adults who have lost access? Uh, I mean, of course, we, you know, are now fine free, um, but some things that we've done in the past, like we've had um, read down fine programs uh, for people to read down their fines. That's, that's been pretty uh, successful. Um, we do still uh, charge for lost items um, with, uh, on, on people's accounts. Uh, but if they do return the item, you know, we don't charge them any type of processing fee or, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it is a hard balance. We do want the material back. That's our preference. Um, so, and sometimes it's just a case by case basis. It depends on what the real situation is with, with that parent or adult. We have a question from yeah. Elizabeth. Um, asking what is the age limit for unattended children now? It's 10. 10, okay. Yeah, 10 and up. Janice um, is asking, Stephanie, if your branch staff were to reflect your community, what would the approximate demographic breakdown be? if my branch staff reflected my community. Um, I don't know, I think we have a pretty diverse staff here. So I think that no matter what time of day um, people would come in, you would be able to find a library member who could help that would reflect our community. So I think, and I think this might be unique to Durham County because it is Durham County and where we live, but we have a very diverse population for our um, library staff in general. I think in comparison to other library, <laughs> in comparison to other library systems, I think Durham County is very diverse. Yeah. We, do, we do lack um, having enough staff with language skills. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that's that's a challenge. So that's that would be one area that we are not doing doing well in. But if you're talking about people of color, and see, this is one this is one reason why I suggest if you can get involved with your county GARE team because the work that you do on that equity um, that toolkit that I talked about it will definitely overflow into the work that you're trying to do with the. Um, with the library. And so one of the things that we have discovered with our work for the overall county is that Durham County as a whole has a very, uh, very small population of Asians in our workforce. Uh, we have a very small population of um, Latinx and um, it's a lot that you discovered that could possibly help you in recruiting or doing what you're trying to do within the library. So it kind of, it, it paints a very clear picture and it can show you exactly where you need to do the work. So if you can possibly get in, involved with your county gear, it will definitely help you to better do the work within the library. So to answer the question, I think that my staff here at North Regional is very reflective of the community that we serve. Yeah, and I'll add also, um, you know, around the, the issue of not having support, um, whether it's from the, the library administration or higher up in, in your um, organization, um, you, you know, maybe one approach to take is, um, is that the work you're doing is about doing the right thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be promoted as uh, racial equity necessarily, but okay. uh, you know, taking the perspective of you know, you're doing the right thing and, and doing what's best for everyone, um, that might can help you make some headway 
um, in, in getting people to really see the importance of it. And I see that Devin put in the chat that the Government Alliance on Racial Equity is a national group. Mm -hmm. So is you should have one in your state. Yeah, for folks that are joining us outside of North Carolina, I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, folks, um, feel free to submit any final questions. Um, one question that did come up a few times in the um, survey that we sent out beforehand, um, does accountability play a factor in an equitable framework? If so, what kind of accountability measures are effective in assessing DEI in a library or a state agency? Um, can it exist from the top down? I, I would think that it has to. Because if, if you don't hold people accountable and it doesn't exist from the top down, then if you try to enforce it, then it's not going to go anywhere. Or if, if there isn't an accountability piece, then people are going to continue to do what they do and it's not going to, nothing's going to happen. So I, I definitely feel that there is an, a huge accountability piece and I feel like it does have to come from the top down. That's why I feel like um, Durham County does have the support of our administration and from our, I mean, from the county, because like I said, they hired a racial equity officer to make sure, you know, to oversee this work and try to move the county forward. So I would say yes. Terry, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I, I don't. Um, but yeah, there definitely is very strong support from the top of the county organization. We have one last question from Gloria asking, um, in regards to the diversity of your staff, is the leadership team reflective of your population as well? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I laugh because um, there, there was a point in time where our entire leadership team was African-American. Um, now there are seven of us on our executive leadership team um, and five of us are African-American and two Caucasian. Thank you yeah. so much, Terry and Stephanie, for taking the time to share what your library is doing and the advice that you've offered. Um, folks, if you want to stick around for the breakout room discussions, um, just stay on the Zoom meeting and I'll split you up automatically into breakout rooms. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one.